Okie dokie. So tonight we are talking about user-defined functions. Now, just to let you know, from the beginning of class, we have been using functions. We haven't necessarily defined them ourselves, but we have been using them. Print is a function. Input is a function. Int is a function. They're all functions that have a, their, their job is to do one thing, and they are defined somewhere. Now, from Python's perspective, they're in the basic module that you get, that you don't have to do anything special. You just get it because you're using Python. And functions are modular code. Because what you can do is you can encapsulate a set of processes, a set, a logic, an algorithm, a set of lines of code into something that you can call by name. Now, up until this point, we've basically named one thing. We've named our variables. Um, at, but now we're going to get to name our functions. So we're going to get to name a block of code that does a specific thing. And that's what a function is. It is a named block of code that has some form of input and gives some form of response most of the time. Um, and so functions have a very specific mm -hmm. syntax like everything else does in Python. There is a new keyword called def, D-E-F, right here. And that is you're going to define a function. So on the left-hand side, you'll see def. You'll have a space. And then you'll have a name. And that's the name you're giving your function. And that's what we're going to call it by. And then you'll have an open and close parenthesis, or sometimes you'll have an open parenthesis and some other stuff and then a closed parenthesis. But it always has to be a matching set of parentheses and then a colon. And that colon is our friend, just like it is with if statements and with loops. You always have to remember the colon. One of the first things that students get wrong when they're starting to do functions is they forget that colon at the end of the def. And for us, it's like this is a sentence, and you put a period there. Well, the colon in this case is like the period. So I'm going to just start by defining a simple function. Python file. And we'll get, I'm just going to define a simple function. Um, and yeah, I have to do this yet. My apologies. Python script, simple function, all right, okay. So I'm just going to define my function. And I'm going to configure my Python interpreter because it should be doing it for me and it still isn't. Okay, and then I am going to say print. This is a simple function. So I've just defined a function in two lines of code. Okay. Now, what do I have? I have the def keyword. I have the name simple. All it is is a word. That word, in this case, is going to define a series of, of codes, block of code, lines of code, that's going to do something. And then I have an open parenthesis a close parenthesis, and the colon. This is a function definition. That is what that is called. Line one is called a function definition. And it is there to set up what you're going to do for the function. And after that, you're going to just type some lines of code. So I said print. This is a simple function. That's the line of code that I typed. So what you'll notice here is that I am indented one to the right. Everything that is inside a function is going to be indented one to the right. So this that's inside the function simple. So is this. 
Oops. So this is not that's not inside the function simple. So I have four lines of code inside the function simple, three lines, sorry, four with the definition, and then I now have one outside. So that's important to note. Now if I tried to run this right now, nothing would happen except print this is not inside the function because we haven't called it yet. There are two parts of functions. There's the def definition and then there's using it. We've just defined it. We haven't used it yet. So if I want to use simple, I can simply call it. So this is a function call. And all I'm going to do is simple. Open and close. So all I've had to do, and what will happen, and I'll show you this in the debugger, what will happen when I call simple is that I will end up at line two. Because simple is being called. That's what line eight is. It's calling a function. Basically what I'm doing is I'm redirecting the processing into another space. By the way, you in Python you have to define your functions before you can use them. So this is up here on purpose. It's at the beginning of the script on purpose. So what I thought I did this. Sorry. I'm going to add this and I'm going to run it real quick. Okay. Why isn't it doing that? There we go. Okay. So I'm going to actually walk through this in the debugger. So I'm just going to put breakpoint there. I'm going to start the debugger. So I'm I'm at simple. That's where I'm starting. And what happens if I do a step into? Most of what we've done in Python has been step over because we've been stepping li over lines of code. So this little arrow here is step into. So I'm going to step into simple because I know simple is a function. And when I do that, I am on line two. So I have been taken from line eight to line two by just saying simple because I've defined simple up here. And now I'm just going to step over. I'm going to step over and this is going to show up. This is a simple function. This is, you know, inside the function. So is this. And then when I'm done, I'm now at 10 and you'll see that I am no longer inside this function. I am outside the function on line 10 and I do this is not inside the function. So that's basically what a function is. Now it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for me to create a function with just a lot of print statements in them. Unless they're long like if you are writing a game and you need to print out the instructions multiple times. So it would be a good place if you were creating functions in your game to have a help function that printed out all of the instructions for your game. So that would be a use of a bunch of print statements uh, in a function. So this is just a simple function and that's just to kind of introduce you to the concept of defining a function, what is in the scope of the function, because that's what this is. Anything that is indented to the right one under a function definition is called in the scope of the function. And that just means that when it's running, these don't, those lines don't exist anywhere else except when you call the function. They're kind of not there until the function is called. Um, oh, and I wanted to show you one thing. If I define a function and I don't indent the first 
or any the first line under that function I can run this and I get indentation error unex, uh, expected an indent block now this is one of the few times that Python actually gives you an error that it means exactly what it says it's expecting this line to be indented one to the right it's expecting line two to be to be tabbed and it wasn't so when I tab it I can now run it successfully. If you get that indentation error, it means you have to indent one to the right, at least one. So, um, let's see, parameters. So, we've just defined a simple function, but it just prints stuff. It doesn't do a lot. Now the power of a function is the fact that you can modify data. You can pull in data and return things. Um, so that's one of the powers of a function. So how do I pass a piece of data into the function? Because you want to be able to do that. You want to be able to send, that's basically what it is, it's send data into the function and then do something to it, and then return a value based on what you did. That's basically an algorithm. So how do you do that? Well, you have something called a parameter and an argument. Okay, a parameter is just, um, it's, a, it's a variable. That's all it is. And it is a variable that is a placeholder for a value that you're going to pass in. And you can then use that variable with that value in it inside the function only. And then you can, you can do something with it. Later on we'll look at returning it. In this case you see that we've defined a pizzeria and they're doing, you know, pizza and diameter. So I'm going to do, um, let's just do a new function, or a new class, Python file, and we'll do rectangle. So for rectangle, I'm going to define um, area. And I want to have a length. And width, W I helps if I can spell. And in that, I'm going to say um, length times width, and then I'm going to print. Now this is again a very simple function and that's okay. We'll look at a little more complex ones later. And then I'm going to call area to 4. So let's just run this really quick and see what happens. So what I have, well let me explain to you what I have. Let me make it a little bigger. Okay, that's not going to work. Never mind. I have my def keyword, means tells Python I am now defining a function. I have the word area, that is the name of my function. I have an open parenthesis. I then have the word length and the word width. Why isn't that? Oh, wait a minute. Sorry, I spelled it wrong. I have the word length and the word width. Those are just words, but for our purposes, they're actual variable names. So up until now, we've always defined a variable as var, or sorry, as, you know, a name. you have a name on the left-hand side of single equal sign. Well, this is a new way for functions only to define variable. Because these, this length, 
and width are actually variables that can be used within the area function. So you can think of them as variables. You can't use them anywhere else but inside this function. Um, and as I'm doing here, I can say length times width. Now the syntax, and we'll expand on this in a little bit, the syntax of the parentheses is you have the name of the, the variable, the, the parameter, a comma, another parameter, a comma, another parameter, on, on, on. So as long as they are separated by a comma, you're good. Now I can use length and width to calculate my area, and then I'm going to print the area of a rectangle is. So let me run this really quick. And what did I do? Oops, I don't have it right. Let me edit the configuration. Okay, rectangle. So I'm going to run this, and we'll see the area of a rectangle is 8. Now, that's pretty simplistic, but why, why couldn't I have just done length times width right there? Well, I could have. But then I would have had to repeat those lines of code if I did this. Oops. Three and five. So all I've added is a single line of code. But when I run it, I now get the area of a rectangle is eight. The area of a rectangle is 15. And that is because I called it again. Okay, I've called it here and I've called it here. And I can call it a third time. Let me get rid of some of those little squiggles from PyCharm. There. So I've called it a third time. So imagine you're writing a program and you've got to do the same action again and again and again but with different input. Let's say you're in a different room now. Um, a function is really handy because you don't have to write the code, in my case, three times. You write the code once and you use it three times. So let's do a little bit, let's do a little debugging again. So I'm just going to run in the debugger. So I'm on line 5. Now you'll notice it didn't stop at line 1, 2, and 3. And that's because the only thing that Python did was recognize that they're there. It actually is not going to execute those lines of code until you hit something that calls it. And that's the other thing that def does. Def says, Read all about this, Python, but don't actually execute those lines of code. It'll execute later when I call. So I'm going to step into area, and I'm going to step over. It calculates my area, and you can see down here in the variables, length and width, and then it's going to print it. And you'll see when I step over, I'm now at line 6. When I step into... I'm back at line 2, but now length is 3 and width is 5. So the values of those parameters have changed because I've called it from here with 3 and 5. So I step over. You'll see length and width is 3 and 5, and my area is 15. And so now I'm on line 7. Same thing happens. I step in to the function. Now my length is 10 and my width is 10 because I passed it in 10 and 10 here and it's going to print it out and I'm done. So that in a very simplistic way is the power of a function. So if you're trying to think of functions in something that would be meaningful, you, meaningful to you as you move forward with your projects, you're going to need functions. Let's say you have to move between rooms. It would be a really good thing to have a function that allows you to move between rooms where you pass in 
where you are and it, and the direction that you want to go and it can come back and tell you whether or not you're allowed to go that direction or what the current room is. So that's just a thought for your function. So those are about parameters. Um, okay. If there's a specific lab or a specific challenge that you want to go through, we will. But if not, then I'll probably just walk through some of the labs when we get to them. All right. So now we know how to get information into a function. How do I get information out? So parameters allow you to pass information in. But sometimes I'm going to want to return something from a function. Let's say I'm doing a complex mathematical calculation and they're going to give me some data and I'm going to give them a result. Well, how do I give how do I give the calling portion of the program a result? I do that with something called a return statement. A return statement just does that. It takes a piece of data that is inside that function. You can look at that function as a box. Okay, the box has an error that goes in and an error that comes out. The error that goes in can only contain data going in, and the error that comes out can only contain data that's going out. You don't actually know what's going on inside that function. You have no visibility to it when the program is running. So, um, where is I going? Sorry. So you can look at a function as kind of a black box. So even though you as the programmer can read it, Python doesn't know anything about that function until that call is made. It only knows that there's a name for it. So you have to pass data in and you get data back. So in this case, they're just calculating something called the square. Okay? So it's the number times itself and it's returning the squared number. And um, so they're using the return statement. And a return statement is just that. It's the keyword return. And then after that, you ha are returning something. In this case, they're returning the product of a mathematical calculation. You might be returning a string. So let's just do simple return. Oops, no, I don't want to do a new project. Oops. Okay, so let's do simple return. So I'm going to define a function. Um, so I'm just making this up off the top of my head. So this is just a little simple return. So 
this is just a small made up function that shows you some different the, the ability to return from a function. So I have a direction. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so this is just a simple function. It's called which room, and I'm putting it into direction. And if the direction is east, then it's going to be east room. If it's west, it's going to be rest, west room. This is all pretty simple. And if it's not one of the ones that I want, then I'm going to say it's an invalid direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call which room. And I'm going to start off by saying east. And what we will see here and here, oh, sorry, so what I'm doing here is I have to find a variable retval. All, it's just a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. If anything is on the left-hand side of a single equal sign, it's always a variable. Even if on the right-hand side of my single equal sign, I have a function. So I'm expecting that this function, which room, is going to return something. It's going to return one of these strings. Okay, so retval is just a variable. It's expecting something to be put into it by which room. Which room will do that based on what it returns. So let's go and debug this. Simple return, there it is. Okay, so I'm just going to start the program. And you will see that it's starting at line 13. Now notice that I also put a breakpoint this time at line 2. It didn't hit the breakpoint. It didn't hit the breakpoint because everything after def, everything after this statement from line 1 through line 11 doesn't actually get executed. It's just kept in storage by Python. For the moment in time when someone says call which room, which is what's happening on 13. So if I continue, which is not step into, and I can do this because I have a breakpoint on 2, I'm going to continue to 2, and what do I have here? Well, I have, if I look in the debugger, my direction is east, so I'm going to return east room. So right now, I'm still within the scope of the function. So line 14 doesn't know anything about which, you know, what the direction is, which com is coming out of which room. So if I step over that, you will notice I end back on 13. And that's simply because I am returning from the function. You'll also know that there's no special characters here because Python hasn't actually finished executing line 13 just yet. When I tell it to make the next step, it does, and you will see that retval is east room. Okay? And so then it's going to print retval. So let's do this. Um, Okay, so I just changed that print statement a bit. So now let's go do this. Let us just come, let's just run this through its paces. So we have west, oops, 
let's get the right keys. West. Uh, south. North. I have chocolate on the brain tonight. So, this is going to be chocolate. North. This is going to be south. So now, I have only still written all these lines of code once. However, I'm going to get a different response for each of these times when I call it. So let's debug this again. I start here on line 13 again. Python just read this into, into its library and it doesn't actually execute it. So now I'm going to continue. I am east, so I'm going to return east room. I'm down here. Let's go to the debugger. Ret val is east room, so I'm going to print that out. I'm now dropping to line 16. I am going to continue, which is going to take me back to line 2 with the direction of west. I'm going to step over it. Now I'm west. It's going to return west room. Now you'll see red val has changed to west room. I'm going to print it. Go to south. South room is what's returned. Going to go to north. North is north pole is returned, and we'll see north pole there on the red bow. Now I have chocolate, and chocolate is invalid, so it's going to return invalid di direction chocolate. Now you think, well, but she put them all in the same order as was in the function. Well, but it doesn't matter. I can move this to here, and I can move this to here, and I can run this program, and I can still get the correct output to my console. No matter how the order I call it in, I will always get the right answer because I'm calling the function and the function knows what to expect. So again, I could put east down here and I would still always get the right answer. So the order, unless you're changing the input, the order doesn't matter. I always get the exact same thing, the exact right thing that I should get no matter how somebody puts in that data. So if I'm running my program, if I'm running your uh, your uh, game and I put in east five times, I'm always going to get the right answer because I've programmed it into my function. Because I've created a function that does that, that, that looks at the directions. So that's just the thought for when you guys write your programs. Um, so at the pyramid volume, dynamic typing. Okay, um, you can pass any type of an object, any any type of a value into a function, and Python will type it automatically. And what they have here is they basically are showing you that there's an add function with x and y. It's going to return x plus y. So if you're adding 5 and 7, it's going to return the, the product of 5 and 7. And if you're passing Torah and Bora, it's going to return the product of Torah and Bora. So Python isn't bound by types. Um, 
because uh, unlike a lot of other languages, C++, C, Java, they're all very type bound. So if I had a function in, Py in Java, I would have to define it as taking an integer or taking a string. You don't have to do that in Python. You just pass in the information, which is great, but which is also not great. Because if you're expecting integers and somebody passes in strings and you try and act on them as an integer, you're going to get an error. Why do we define functions? Well, they say it improves readability, but really it's reusability. The reason we define functions is because we're going to use the same block of code again and again and again, and the input might change. So if the input's going to change, if it's something you don't know, if you have somebody from the outside running your programming and putting the direction east in 15 times to see just what will happen, <coughs> students in my class, um, you want to be able to make sure that you have consistent code that does just what you need. So you put things in functions. I write functions all the time. Functions are bread and butter to programmers. And it is modularizing code. You take, a, you take a series of things that have to happen that make a logical sense and you package them up and you name them. You write a name on that package and you put it on the shelf. And after you've tested that package, you know that um, you know that when you put something into that function, you're always going to get the expected value out of the function. So that's really why we why we program functions. It's reusability. Now here they're going to talk about function stubs, and it is a development practice, and a lot of developers do it. They create a stub for a function. So all that is is um, you've created the function definition, but you don't actually know what the algorithm is. Maybe the guy three doors down is working on the algorithm, or the guy you know, in England is working on the algorithm. But you need to be able to call a function like that to work on your code. So what people do is they do what they call stubbing. So you'll have... Um, You'll, you'll define something with the same function name and the same number of parameters, and you'll basically put can data in there. So when I pass in two, I always get four back. Or when I pass in Lisa, I always get Shannon back. Um, and that's all a stub is. And then later on, you'll remove that stub and put the real thing in there so that you can continue to work on your code when somebody across the world is working on their code and you guys need to interact. So that's what a, a stub is. Functions and branches and looping. You can have all the branches and all the looping that you want in a function. You can call a function from branches and from loops. Um, so they really do inter they, they just interplay. As you can see here, I have a bunch of if statements. So, and you can also use things like, um, you know, lists. So if I have a list and I call my listers equal east, west, north, south. Okay, so I just created a list. That's all I did. Now, there's an easier way to do this. And so I'm just going to comment this code out. Uh, yeah, here. I'm just going to do this. I'll do this. I'm going to define which room to, and so you can see the difference. Which room to? Uh, 
Oops, I didn't need to do that. I really can type. So what I've just done, and I'm just kind of showing you what the difference is here, because we're talking about loops and we're talking about if statements. So you can do all of that in a function. Um, you can also use things like in in a function. So actually, let me do this. Let me do key values. So this is going to be, I'm going to make this a dictionary. And I'm going to say east is going to be um, east room, west is going to be west room, north is going to be north pole, and south is going to be pink. Sandy Beach. How's that? So I have a dictionary now. And I'm going to use this dictionary. I'm passing in direction. And by the way, the direction on line 15 is not the, the direction on line 3. They're completely separate as far as Python thinks. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say for, oh, what's my syntax? Uh, shoot. I have to go out and look something up, and you can do this too. Four over dictionary. That's what I want. I've been writing Java today, and my brain is not functioning in Python. So, how to iterate over a dictionary? Okay. So. What are you telling me? I don't like it. Four key in dict. That's what I want. Thank you. Four key in ders. It, um, if key is direction return uh, ders of C. So let's see what happens when I do which room two instead of which room. So all I'm going to do is change the name here to two. And see what happens. So if I run this, which room isn't going to be called, which room two is, and what I'm doing this is I'm doing this to show you um, that you can use for loops and if statements inside a function. So I'm just going to run this, and you'll see that these all change. So room based on north is North Pole, West Room, Pink Sandy Beach, chocolate is none. So I have to do something else. I'm going to say if, uh, so chocolate is none, yeah, we'll leave it like that for now. I'm not going to bother changing it. What I wanted to show you was, I didn't want to go down that rabbit hole, uh, what I wanted to show you was that you can do for and if statements and else and all of that inside a function. So let's keep going. Functions are objects. That's true. They do exist as an object. Function common errors. There are lots of common errors that you can make in a function. Um, be careful with copy and pasting. I copy and paste errors all the time. We talked a little bit about scope of variables and functions. Just remember that when you're inside the function, the scope is the function scope, and those parameters don't exist anywhere outside that function. Here, if you see total inches, that does not exist anywhere outside that function. When you're outside that function call, when you've returned back into the normal script, 
you can forget it. It's not going to be there. Um, namespaces and scope resolution. I'm not going to go into any more of that. Arguments. Um, arguments, immutability. Um, let's see. What do they want us to say? Arguments. Okay. Pass by assignment. Don't worry about that. Um, that that's a really good construct to understand, but it's not something that you're going to have to really worry about a lot. Um, okay, default parameters. Default parameters are extremely handy because what you can do is you can allow someone to call a function kind of with all the arguments because right now, You'll see I'm calling which room with direction. So actually, if for some reason I did this, you think Python would like that? If I run this, I get this type error. Right? It says which room is missing one required positional argument direction, which is saying, hey, wait a minute. You didn't pass me in all the right stuff. You did not. I'm expecting direction. You did not give me direction. So I'm stopping. That's what I'm doing. So how do I avoid that? Well, here's how I avoid that. I can give it a default parameter. So I'm going to say direction equals north. So if I do that, and I'm going to stop here and debug this guy, and what happens when I step over 20? Well, I actually don't error out this time. There's no error on the console. And that's because I have given direction a default value of north. How did I do that? Well, because, um, ignore those, I just stopped the program. Because direction is in essence a variable. I can assign it a value when I am defining the function. So what I'm saying here is if they don't pass in anything, if nothing is passed in, just like it is here on 20, assume north. And that's really handy because if you have a lot of different uh, parameters in a function like they do here. You know, they've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's a lot if you always have to remember to pass in seven. But what if you only wanted to pass in two? Well, you could redefine this print book description to have a version of equal one and or a num page is equal 100. And that would make it easier later on for the programmer. So that's what a default value does in a function. And this is also what it will let you do. It lets you, um, it, it just, it makes your function more versatile. Okay. So let's see if we can get to some labs. Arbitrary argument lists. We won't really be using them in this class. But basically what it does is it allows you to pass in some number of arguments that have not been predefined. Um, and it's, it's a very handy thing to do, but it doesn't necessarily make your code more readable. Some people use variable arguments and some people don't. I think for readability that you should avoid variable arguments. And you should either do default or pass in lists or things like that. But that's my personal preference. That is not necessarily, there's not necessarily anything wrong with variable arguments. I just have my personal preferences because I'm a programmer. Um, multiple function outputs. This is extremely handy. So I'm going to do a new one that is multiple returns. New Python file return. Okay. 
So I'm going to define a function, and I'm going to take x and y, and I'm going to say square is x of a rectangle x times y. And I'm going to say, I don't know, uh, stir is And now I'm going to return rect and stir. This is something pretty unique in Python. A lot of languages do not allow you to return multiple variables. And so when I call, I'm going to say um, r1 s1 equals func 10 10. And we'll just do this a little bit. We'll just make that 2 and 2 and we'll make that 3 and 3 and we'll make that 4 and 4 and then I'm just going to print R1, S1, I'm just going to print R2, S2, I'm only going to do this three times actually. I'm going to print R3, S3, and this is going to just be 9 and 9. nine, eight, and eight. So let me put a break point here, put a break point there, change this. Okay, multi-return and debug. So I am calling my function func. Whoops. Cancel, continue. So I have 10. I passed in 10 and 10. I'm going to calculate the area of the rectangle, and then I'm going to have a string that formats it, and then I'm going to return both. I'm going to return this variable and that variable. So when I come out, I have R1 is 100, and S1 is the area of 10 and 10 is 100. And then I'm going to go for the next one and the next one, and we'll see these on the console. So that's what a multi-return does, and it's extremely handy to have the ability to return multiple things. So this is just about documents, doc strings, and document functions. And this is an engineering example, and now we're going to do lab swapping values, swapping variables. This is a standard thing, and this is where you're going to want to do a multi-return, okay? So basically, this is a swap function. Every, every computer course in the world wants you to do a swap function. So uh, basically, you are passing in two values, and then you're going to return um, Write a program whose input is two integers and whose output is the two integers swapped. So, yeah, you're just going to swap um, user val1 and user val2, and you'll basically return user val2 and user val1. So that's what you're going to do, and then you'll print it out. Um, and actually...
So if you want to look this up, you can, and there are some very good in, uh, examples on how to swap values. So read up on them and, and think about what they mean in terms of inputs and in terms of return statements. Exact change. We've done this before. Okay? Everybody in this class has done, a, an, ex, an, um, done an exact change already. I think it was for three. And it was the one where you had to use the floor. So go back, get that lab, and use it for this. Because what you're doing here is you're using that exact change, but you're adding it to a function. And then you're going to return some things from that function. So don't completely rewrite the exact change stuff. Go back to lab three, go back to three, get your stuff out of that lab and put it in a function here. Okay, so you're going to have exact change and exact change is going to take in the user total. So it's going to take in the fact that, you know, it's 120 or 88 or whatever it is. It's then going to go for the exact change and you're going to do a multi-return with num dollars, num quarters, num dimes, num nickels, and num pennies, and then do the print statement. So this is a multi-return, which means that you need to have a variable in the function of num dollars, a variable in the function of num quarters. So if you're wondering kind of how that looks, this is what it looks like. I have a, a rect here, and I have a stir here. And they're both variables in the function, and then I return them, okay? One thing to remember is order matters when you're returning. So the first return here is the first variable there. The second return here is the second variable there. If I swap these two, then I get a different output by just changing the order of those. So here we say 100 is the area of 10 and 10 is 100. If I swap these, if I did you'll notice that this is going to change. It's going to be backward. The area of 10 and 10 is 100, 100. The area of 9 and 9 is 81, 81. All that I did was change line 4. I change it back and you will see that the, that the output goes back to what it was originally. So order matters. So when you're doing this function, make sure that you are, when you do the multi-return, that your variables on the left-hand side of that return statement are being set to be correct amount from here. So don't rewrite the the um, don't rewrite everything. Bring that over. Now the print part of this will be outside the function and the calculation part will be inside the function. So the part where you're using the floor to determine you know how many dollars there are and how many quarters and how many nickels and how many pennies that's going to be done inside your exact change function. You're going to return the number of dollars, number of quarters, dimes, nickels, and pennies. And then you're going to do the print portion of that outside the function. Um, does anybody, I know I ran a little long, does anybody have any questions? Is there anything you need me to go over in more detail? I'm going to assume that's a no, so I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to stop the recording, and this will hopefully be up tomorrow. Have a good night, everyone.